So Sam, a very, very warm welcome. I'm so glad that you made it here to our studio. Thank you for being here this evening. Thank you, Mark, for having me. And uh, for both of you, Mark and Cindy, for creating this beautiful space that we're sitting in and uh, the Moya platform. And so Sam, I'm interested, how <laughs> long have you lived in Cape Town? Because originally you're from Holland. Yes, I'm from Holland, Amsterdam. And I've been in Cape Town now for 19 years. Yeah. Um, so it's been a while. You've quite settled and you're ready to call yourself a Cape Townian. Yeah, I think I, I use the term now, now and cozy, cozy and all those kind of South African terms by now. Yeah. So tonight we're really interested in your journey of learning how to manage your sensitivity. Hmm. When was the turning point for you? I think, look, I've always thought I was different. Yeah. Actually, I thought I was a bit defected. Actually, like there was something wrong with me yeah. because other people seem to, I don't know, live in the world and they seem to not have a problem with that. Yeah. For me, it felt difficult and very overwhelming. Yeah. I didn't really share that though, because I thought everybody's getting the same amount of input, which is not true. So sensitive yeah. people have a more sensitive nervous system. Yeah. So they get more input. So more, more stimuli from externally and internally, yeah. and they process those stimuli deeper. Yeah. If a normal person would just like say at a party, a person yeah. would walk in, you, you might walk into a party and you, you see your friend and you just walk over to your friend and you say hi. Mm. A, a sensitive person comes into that space, into that party, mm. and they notices the light, the warmth of the light, the color of the room, the, the mood in the room, the, like everything about it, mm. the, the loud person talking in the corner, the, the, the catering girl who, who might come bring a, a glass of wine and she might notice that person. So growing up, there was a lot of information mm -hmm. that really confused me also because people would say they were fine, but I could feel they weren't fine. So mm -hmm. I, I stopped trusting myself. Mm -hmm. right? So I didn't understand how the world worked. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of created this persona of this, this good girl, this nice person, this is always fine and helpful and nice and kind, non-confrontational, because I could feel that when others didn't like so much what I said, or if it made them feel uncomfortable or angry or irritated. So I kind of created this little persona. And I think the turner point for me really was when I read the book, Highly Sensitive Person mm -hmm. uh, by Elaine Aaron, I think her name is. And I kind of was like, and this is like, I mean, I'm now like in my thirties. Mm -hmm. I was like, oh, doesn't everybody have that? Doesn't everybody get that information? I really didn't know. Yeah. And I was really like, oh, so maybe it's not so much that I'm not getting it. I'm just wired differently. And maybe if I learn to, to work with that, to manage that in a different way, instead of copy, copying what I see all the other people do, then maybe the, yeah, my life will change a little bit. Yeah. Um, and don't get me wrong, because on the outside, I looked perfectly okay. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that I looked like a mess at all. I looked very professional, very successful. My life looked really you know, ticked all the boxes, but on the inside, I was constantly feeling overwhelmed and I often tried to hide myself. Mm. So what were some of the more difficult situations that you encountered? I think the most difficult situation is if you want something and, and you're trying to express your needs, especially when I was younger, if I would express my needs mm. and people didn't even so much have to say something mm. and I could already feel that they weren't agreeing with it. So the uncomfortableness come to, comes from then suppressing your needs altogether, Com to totally pleasing other people all the time and you know doing what they're wanting to do. And then internally, that's when then 
you know, it's, it doesn't sit so well. Yeah. So you were like managing their emotions for them by yes. yeah. what you were saying and doing yeah. and, and choosing to say or do things yeah. perhaps inauthentically for yourself, but mm. to keep them happy. Yeah. And yeah. did this play out like in your family and at school Everywhere. and at work? Everywhere. What was the impact in your career? Well, I guess that I chose a career uh, in the early days that I wasn't really interested at all. I mean, mm -hmm. I wanted to study psychology because obviously when you get a lot of data and you process them deeply, like I like watch people, especially like a lot of sensitive people are observers, mm -hmm. you know, to know how to navigate. You, you learn a lot about people. Mm -hmm. So I found people really interesting. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to study psychology. And my, my dad said that all psychologists are crazy. So I studied economics no interest in economics whatsoever yeah. but it didn't really interest me yeah so you're making decisions to make other people happy yeah yeah mm. you don't uh, use the term empath much but are we talking about the same thing yeah so i think when you're talking about highly sensitive um and empath it's, it's on an empathic scale so yeah. the more uh, not all highly sensitive people are empaths Although I must say, the more and more I'm in touch with my sensitivity, yeah. the more s sensitive I'm getting, right? The more I'm allowing it, yeah. I, I would say I'm, I myself go more towards being an empath. Yeah. But not every single highly sensitive person would say that they're an empath. Okay. Mm. And how many people on average, or do you have an idea how many people in the world are highly sensitive? Yeah, so they're estimating uh, between 15 to 20 percent and it's that it's a generic uh, genetic um, kind of pre or how do you say that? Yeah, predisposition. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So you, you sort of went through this experience of being highly sensitive until in your th early 30s when you read this book. Yeah. What, what sort of uh, aha moments did you have at that point? Well, the main one was that maybe there wasn't something wrong with me yeah. and maybe there was actually something right with me yeah. that even that I could use it as an advantage. It's always been a disadvantage. Right. That's the world, how the world seems to celebrate and lord extroverts yeah. and people who yeah. are narcissistic and yeah. in, in a way, you, you know, yeah. you look at business and politics. Yeah. Yeah, so it's a different world for a sensitive person. Yeah, um, I think also busyness, you know, people, oh, how are you? I'm busy and it's a good thing. Yeah. You know, so being busy is seen as something to celebrate. Yeah. For a sensitive person, being busy is, feels terrible. It feels yeah. like way too much. It feels like, like overwhelming. Yeah. Yeah. And you started to learn how to use your sensitivity mm -hmm. to your advantage. Yeah. How did you do that? I really, uh, like, I guess I first um, looked at my kind of unhealthy relationships. They were very codependent. Mm -hmm. uh, so I started doing a lot of research, lots of reading and putting things into practice. I found that I was very uh, disconnected from myself. Yeah. Like, because when the focus is always over there, mm -hmm. there's no focus here, there's nobody home. Mm -hmm. And I felt that I was really almost dissociated. Like mm -hmm. I wasn't really here, especially for the first, my childhood, I'd have very little memories of, just not really present. Mm -hmm. And then in my teenage and my twenties, I mean, I, I was just using alcohol to numb the sensitivity. Yeah. And it worked. Like I, I like, you know, my goal was to fit in. Yeah to not look bad, get attention for being bad and not get attention either for being outstanding. Mm -hmm. Kind of like, just like a comfortable, staying in the middle kind of thing. When I started to connect with myself more, mm -hmm. look, I found like, you know, it wasn't pretty in the beginning. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of emotions that I didn't, I hadn't ever looked at. 
Um, so I had to really connect with myself, with my heart. Things started to change. I started to look at what do I want? Mm -hmm. How do I feel? What do I think of this? And before that, I never had an opinion. Mm -hmm. I, I really didn't know. People would ask my opinion. I would be like, I did. What do you think? Uh, yeah, you yeah. Yeah. So I started to kind of go, oh, what, what do I need? I don't need to be busy. It's mm -hmm. actually that doesn't serve me. I need to look after myself much better. I need time every day just by myself. Mm -hmm. Spending time, uh, I started meditating. Yeah. You say you, you felt like dissociated. Did you feel ungrounded at all? Yeah. Before that? Yeah. Yeah. Very. So, you know, I think, I think we'll have a lot of people in the spiritual community who will relate to this. Yeah. You know, I relate to it, you know. So as you started to get more in touch and more embodied, if we say, mm -hmm. more grounded, you started to feel these emotions yeah. coming up for you. Can you tell us a bit more about that? What did that feel like? What did it look like? And then how did you cope with that? I started to connect with my anger because, well, firstly, I thought other people are crossing my boundaries, but obviously when you start taking a little bit more responsibility, it's like, mm, have I even informed them of where my boundaries are? Because I, I never knew. So, so I started connecting more with what's okay for me what's not okay for me and i started expressing that more yeah. connecting with um sadness around uh, my dad died i never really connected with that in 2005 so i had to go back and really go through that and feel mm -hmm. that and invite that in so i really did that thing with people say like go have a cup of tea with every emotion invite them in, um, and, and not only with the negative emotions. I mm. mean, it's also being here more. It's also like, wow, I mean, being sensitive, you notice all the different, little different things, mm. little things. So it's like, oh, look at the butterfly and the light on that tree. I mean, I really started to also see that when you invite back all the emotions, mm and you're here, there's so much beautiful to see, especially when you're sensitive. Yeah. What was the most difficult period for you? I think when I started to know what I didn't want, so I, I, I started getting in touch with that, but I still had no clue what I did want. Mm. And also I think when you start to get in touch with yourself, if you've always been a person who's so agreeable, and who's always so helpful and you know then it's when you change it's difficult for the people around you yeah. because all of a sudden you have an opinion and you say no and all these things and so friendships change the relationship changed and i was no longer happy just kind of doing what i was always doing yeah. so i had to look at well, what do I actually want to do for a career? Because doing marketing is definitely not what I want to do. Yeah. Yeah, I'm sure living uh, in a corporate environment would have been very difficult for a sensitive yeah. person. Yeah. 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 Uh, it doesn't fit. Any sort of like examples of really difficult experiences in your, you know, from your career days? Well, look, I, I like, don't like public speaking, yeah. as you know. Uh, so doing presentations is definitely not one of the things I would choose to do. Being put on the spot, talking about something you have actually no passion for. Mm. Like, uh, like with now, obviously, with these kind of things, it's still difficult. But when you're really passionate about what you do, then that kind of counters the, the fear a bit. Yeah. When it's something you really don't care about, it doesn't, or at least not for me. So putting myself in situations like that is definitely wasn't something I enjoyed. Also like big gatherings, big meetings, I found them really exhausting. Yeah. This brings me to an interesting question that's just popped up for me. Are any of your children sensitive and how do they handle school? Yeah, so um, I think both my children are sensitive. Yeah. One bit more introverted than, and the other a bit more extroverted, but both quite sensitive, uh, so they've both been going to Montessori school. I definitely 
do not think the schooling system is made for sensitive children, mm -hmm. if for any other children, but yeah. that's a different discussion. I'm very passionate about uh, yeah. schooling, yeah. So do you notice uh, any of the symptoms that you experienced in childhood in your children when they mm -hmm. get home from school? Yeah, so uh, not so much around the schooling, but in my youngest son, he will always ask me if I'm okay. Yeah, okay. Are you okay? And when he feels that I'm not okay, he will come and give me a hug. And I will say to him, I'm feeling overwhelmed because I also want to teach him, like he often feels overwhelmed and then we can talk about it. So I think for him, it's a huge advantage that I, you know, I've spoken to him about being sensitive, what it means, especially the younger one, the older one, because he's extroverted. Mm -hmm. It's slightly different, but it, he still uh, picks up, especially when he was younger, he used to pick up on all the different tiny little things and details. Yeah. yeah. You, you touched on something earlier that I think is very interesting, the subject of boundaries. Mm. Now, as a sensitive person who may have not had boundaries when you were young, how did you go about bringing boundaries in? I think for me, it was really uh, not so much like coming up with them as in making them rules, because as you know, life is not, you know, you can't put yourself in a box. So for me, it was learning to feel where my boundaries were. Mm. And it eventually actually, this is how I feel right now. Yeah. Because one day it might be okay, and the next day it might not be. So, so the, I, I started to like realize that there's not so much a rule of this is not okay, although some things obviously are, mm. but like today, that's not okay for me or, or today i need this or yeah and how do you discern where that boundary is do you have like a technique or a, something uh, that you do i feel it in my body yeah yeah so it's like a, a an experience of i don't know i start getting a so it's not resentment but there is like an uncomfortable feeling that this is not okay for me mm. yeah now as you as your life changed after reading this book and you became aware of your sensitivity and you started to use it as a gift, you also started to develop other tools or techniques that you now work with your clients? Yeah. Uh, that you so, use with your clients? So I think, uh, obviously, then eventually I, I trained as a coach because I, like, I thought, what do I actually want to do? And I can tell you that first day in, in the in the setting of the coaching uh, school, I was like, oh my God, this is amazing. It like really felt like coming home. Yeah. So obviously we, we get taught a certain way of coaching. It's mm. the integral uh, approach. But through time and working with my clients, I started bringing more and more of my own journey in. Yeah. So I saw, like I obviously often attract similar people mm -hmm. to yourself. So I started to attract a lot of sensitive people who had really good results. Um, and I could see like a sort of a pattern, you never really coach a person the same. Mm -hmm. But I st started to see like, like a little bit of a pattern of how, how to coach a sensitive person and how to really, because that's really what it's about, reconnect them back to themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we're going to see if there are any questions coming in here. I see there are a few comments of people who are really resonating with what you're saying. Hmm. Now, in your coaching, your sensitivity is really a gift. And I know at least one of your clients has described your coaching as coaching with a bit of magic. Hmm. How, how does that come through for you in your coaching? I mean, because you're able to sense things that aren't being said, but also perhaps things that aren't even being understood by the clients. Mm, yeah. And I think that, or that's why also going through the coaching school was, was such a magical experience for me because not only had I a disadvantage, like I always thought in, in life, I actually all of a sudden had an advantage because like you said, I could hear what they weren't saying. Mm. I got like I, I sense into people, it sounds a bit weird, but I can sense into them. Mm. So I can feel if what, 
what they're saying, if it's even true, because sometimes um, people say things that aren't true and sometimes they don't even know they're not true. Mm. And I get, it's really hard to describe, but I, I'm seeing that client already as a whole, like, them, like I see them as their true self already. Mm. And I can kind of guide them towards that. And I get guided as well. Mm. I don't know, that might sound quite... Yeah, so you've got, uh, your sensitivity comes with the gift of intuition. Yeah. And, yeah. and this helps guide your coaching process. Yeah, I've learned the more and more I follow it, the more and more information I get. Okay. So we've got a question from Claire, wondering about uh, the use of alcohol in your journey. Mm. Now, I know that a lot of sensitive people can use substances to cope. Mm. Uh, star seeds are known for having problems with substance abuse. Mm. How did that journey work for you and how did it change? So it wasn't that I was an alcoholic, but I definitely was using alcohol going into busy places. I would definitely have to have a drink because mm -hmm. it would just numb everything. Mm -hmm. Like, I, you know, if I would now walk into a club, I don't think I could even, probably even do it. I would, yeah, I would numb it. So I, I would drink alcohol to not have to feel all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that went on for a long time. I only actually, and I smoked as well, and can hardly even believe it now. Mm. Um, but it helps, right? It's a smoke mm. screen, so you don't get all the information. Yeah. Uh, it only stopped when I, I was pregnant. Okay. So I fell pregnant, and then all of a sudden I was here. Yeah. And that was quite a shock. Yeah. And then have you been to places like that since? Do, do you ever go to, no. to crowded places where... Not really, unless it's outside. And, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it's not that I have anything against alcohol. I mean, I will have a glass of wine, but it's, I can't handle... Also, the more I'm now allowing my, my sensitivity, the also I can't actually drink more than one glass of wine. I can't drink yeah. coffee at all. I used to drink coffee. I can't drink it at all. It's also sensitive people. They don't, uh, they're also often very sensitive physically to mm -hmm. chemicals, all sorts of things. I mean, I had to change my entire diet. Yeah. I didn't know what was going on. Like obviously being a good Dutch girl, I've been raised on bread and cheese. <laughs> I can't eat uh, either of those yeah. things now. Yeah. And so hardly drinking yeah. at, at all. Yeah. So we've got a question here. Let's let's see what Audrey has to say. Being highly sensitive is one, one. So being highly sensitive, one is also very receptive to others' feelings and emotions. Can you give us some tips on how to distinguish what might be our emotions versus others, as there is a tendency to get overwhelmed and have difficulty knowing what we what we're experiencing is ours or not ours. Yeah, so I think that's the uh, a practice and it that's, is not like a simple little trick. It's really around learning to connect with yourself. So say you're in a room with somebody who's angry. In the beginning, I actually had to be there and then take myself away and go, okay, what's this bringing up in me? Mm -hmm. Because my tendency is, is to go over there yeah. and either try to fix it or feeling really upset about it or so, and then I get all enmeshed, right? Yeah. So I, in the beginning, actually literally had to take myself away and go, what is mine? And really feel here instead of over there. And then being okay with what arises as well, mm -hmm. not running away from it because also sensitive people, they experience their emotions more and deeper, more intense. Mm -hmm. So we also have a tendency to, to not go here. Yeah. Um, so I really had to learn to embrace my own emotions. Yeah. When I, the more I did that, the more I knew that's yours, this is mine, that's your responsibility, and this is mine. Yeah. If you want to talk about it, it's okay, but I, I'm not responsible. And that's as a child, I always felt responsible for the other. So feeling your emotions and allowing yourself to feel your emotions 
taught you to differentiate between what was yours and what yeah. was theirs. Yeah. Okay. So that's a useful tool for everybody. Let's see what the question from Leon is. Is sensitivity and introversion the same thing? And if not, what is the difference? How do you approach a partner in a relationship that is high on sensitivity and high on introversion? Okay, so let's go to the first part of the question, if it is the same. Yeah. Look, I do think a lot of highly sensitive people are introverted. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily mean they're introverts because I think what happens is because the world is so overwhelming, if you don't know how to manage your sensitivity and your input, mm -hmm. you might start hiding for the pro from the world. Doesn't necessarily mean that you are introverted because when people start to manage their sensitivity and the, their input for their nervous system a bit better, some people actually find out, actually, I'm a bit more extroverted than I thought. If I just measure it you know if i don't look maybe i don't have to go to that party for four hours but maybe if i just go for an hour i might really enjoy it uh, so sometimes it's more a hiding from the world than actually being introverted but i do think that most highly sensitive people are more on the introverted side than on the extroverted side mm -hmm. so the next part of the question then is how do you approach a partner in a relationship that is sensitive and introverted? Gently. Yeah. Gently, patiently, listening. Yeah. Often uh, sensitive people don't talk a lot about themselves. Yeah. I mean, there will be people on this webinar who haven't heard me talk so much in, in a row, probably. So I would say, yeah, gently. I mean, so when you feel your emotions deeper, and you're aware of every little twitch and little turn. Like I know every little twitch of disapproval mm -hmm. or from my partner. So he doesn't even have to say it. Yeah. So it's like gently, you don't know, no need for any harsh words. If you don't like something, just say it and explain yourself gently yeah. and ask them, how, how are you? because they will have the tendency to put all the attention on you. And some people really like that. But if you want to have a good relationship, obviously there should be a little bit of both. Yeah. So it's like, ask them how they are and don't let them always put the attention back on you, especially when they've maybe had a difficult day. It's like, it is good for them to talk yeah. about their feelings. So perhaps dig a little bit deeper. Dig a little bit deeper, but gently. Go give gently. them the opportunity to. Yeah. And do you want us to send her a copy of this recording to your husband? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, you will probably be watching this, but yes. <laughs> okay, let's see what Erica's question is. What is your, in, what in your opinion is the minimum requirement or qualification towards coaching or guiding others? Um, look, I was trained uh, by the Center for Coaching and they are uh, ICF accredited. So that's the International Coach Federation. I do think it's important that people have a good understanding of processes, uh, other people uh, and themselves. So when you, you go to a good coaching school, you will also go through a process to under, to understand yourself more and you get coached and so i would say icf accredited coaching schools definitely yeah. what was the greatest gift for you from studying to become a coach doing what i love yeah yeah i love my work every day what what specifically about it do you love i love seeing people step into themselves yeah and starting to like themselves and then love themselves and then find their gifts and express them into the world. Yeah. Is this similar to the process that you went through as you, as you sort yeah. of started to use yeah, your sensitivity? Yeah. yeah. What are some of the biggest transformations you've seen in your clients? <clears throat> I think a lot of is in relationships, mm. marriages, sometimes marriage surviving, sometimes not, where women starting to stand up for themselves. I get a lot of 
people are very, very in very unhealthy relationships. Mm -hmm. Uh, see a big transformation in that, but also women quitting their corporate jobs and starting their own companies and starting to do what they love. Mm -hmm. I actually coach quite a lot of women who then eventually go study as a coach. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose if you're working with sensitive people and it's a gift yeah. in coaching. Yeah. 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 Okay. yeah. Uh, a question from Claire is how do you manage the intensity of your emotions? Look, I think the more you invite them in, the less intense and the less scary they seem. Yeah. Because I used to be really scared of them, and now actually I'm not so much that scared of them. And I, I use different processes. So I dance. Mm -hmm. So I take my big emotions into a dance. Mm -hmm. And that, that really, I don't know, I really feel like I can process them well through that. Yeah. And I also think, don't forget, it's not only the, the bad emotions you feel more intensely. Mm -hmm. It's also the, the, more, the, the more positive ones. So you're also able to feel more joy mm -hmm. and beauty. I mean, and I love just looking out in the world and appreciating all the beauty that's there as well. So I also get to enjoy the other side of it. Mm -hmm. So the dancing is interesting because it's quite a good way of grounding oneself mm. and being mm. embodied. Yeah. Did, did you dance much as a child? No, no, we didn't really dance much. No. Yeah. yeah. How, how soon after reading the book and your turning point, did you start to use dance as a tool for processing emotions and grounding and embodiment? Uh, I actually was introduced to five rhythms, which is the kind of dancing I do. Yeah through uh, my coaching uh, school. Yeah. So yeah, the Center for Coaching, we actually had somebody coming in, giving us a class and I loved it. And it was really interesting because obviously I don't like being out there, mm -hmm. but in dancing, it doesn't matter. I, I, I'll be the first one on the dance floor. I love it. Yeah, mm. good. Uh, Claire's got a question about how you manage your energy when you're coaching. And I suspect this, relates to your energy versus your clients mm. now you could have a client come in who's had a hell of a day mm. and his energy is all over the place and quite intense how do you deal with that finally when i'm coaching i am in such a zone mm. i'm really connected and grounded that i can feel it but it really doesn't at all interfere with my energy system yeah. at all uh, probably more the opposite that my energy will calm them. Yeah. Mm. yeah so you start to share your energy mm. rather than. Yeah, I might even do that on purpose. Like. Yeah. Okay. So my next question is what is what are some tips that you would give to other people who are highly sensitive? Look after yourself. Like really feel what you need. Uh, and if that's a break and that is not socially accepted, mm. have the break anyway. Mm. So a, what, what, what are, how can somebody look after themselves besides taking a break? Well, for example, like a lot of my coaches go sit in their car. So say you still work in corporate, mm. then you might just take yourself out of the uh, environment for a little bit. You might go for a walk in nature if that's possible or sit in your car and do a quiet meditation or something. I, myself, I, I have baths. Mm -hmm. um, I really like to get in a, into a bath to cleanse my energy and to just have some time to myself. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are so many tools. Uh, music is a beautiful one. We're mm -hmm. also way more receptive to music. So mm -hmm. beautiful, calming music. So meditation this, yeah meditation managing your energy yeah and, yeah and so all the usual really yeah. like, uh, Lizelle says she loves taking salt baths mm, yeah i have an epsom salt a couple of times a week yeah, yeah. So what tips will you give to people uh, you know as a sort of like a parting comment what perhaps three tips for sensitive people mm, i think one tip tip but a little bit of wisdom because you feel other people's emotions and mood, it doesn't mean that you're responsible for them. Mm. Other tip, really look after yourself. Le yeah. Learn how this works. 
how you work because also I'm not the same as everybody else. So learn what works for you and give yourself permission to be who you are. I think when I started giving myself permission, that was big. Mm. If that meant, I mean, as a coach, I mean, I don't see five people a day. Mm. I know a lot of people who do that. I can't do it. Mm. And in the beginning, I was like, oh, I must have more people, more people. And it doesn't really work for me. So mm. it's like, when you give yourself permission to be who you are. So mm. two, two, three people for me is enough. What is your biggest obstacle to being who you are? The idea of being different, I think, not yeah. fitting in, the belief that looking after myself is selfish, yeah. and a belief that if I put myself out there, I'm an attention seeker. Yeah. <laughs> yeah? So those were, yeah, especially now still sometimes, yeah. can be things that are in the way, and I have to go and say, no, that's old programming. Yeah. Do you have any other book recommendations? And you mentioned on a video. So books, videos, anybody to follow that you could um, For me, one person that made it for me easy to, to take the focus away from there was the work from Byron Katie. Mm -hmm. uh, it actually is called The Work. So when I was focusing over there, it was easy for me to bring myself back. I think another uh, good book that made a lot of, um, impact on it had a lot of impact on me is women who love too much mm -hmm. it's a book about codependency yeah. i can't remember who wrote it I, I read it years and years ago i mean i have over the years i mean i must have read hundreds of books i can't mm -hmm. really remember them all yeah. but those are the ones that are kind of standing yeah. out now is codependency a common problem with sensitive people yeah uh -huh, so what, what sort of like leads well to this that? whole like if you're okay then I, then i'm okay right yeah so if i can fi feel your energy then now i want to do something about that yeah and i've learned actually you're not only not doing yourself a favor you're not doing the other person a favor either because they don't get to learn the lessons yeah. that they're meant to learn yeah let them fall let them be stressed let them be upset and uh, because it's important as you know to yeah. go through your own journey yeah you're not responsible for other people's emotions no no great well sam thank you so much it has been a wonderful opportunity to really get to know you a bit better and to to learn from some of your work